everybody. Um, you're very welcome to Copyright House here um, for a very interesting evening in store. Um, we're going to be talking to a band six years together and they've had a pretty brilliant year. They released their critically and commercially acclaimed and lauded album, Absolute Zero, this year. Will you please give a very warm welcome and welcome to the stage here at Copyright House, Little Green Cars. All right, so this is uh, Little Green Cars, as you all know. Uh, Dylan, Faye, Donna, Stevie, Adam. 2008, you released your first EP. 2013, your first album, like, you know what I mean? But I remember, I think the first I've heard of you guys was about 08, and somebody sent me a video of a Balcony TV performance. What was the song? Something about Into My Arms? In the Arms of My Daughter, yeah. There we go. And we were 16? We were 16, didn't we? 15. Dylan was 15. I mean... 15. I mean, <laughs> what was it that brought you all together? Like, you were so young to be starting as a band, and yet, even at that stage, people were talking about Little Green Cars, and there was hype. I mean, Adam, what was it that brought you together as musicians to, to make the music that you make? Um, well, Donna and I had a band when we were about 13 years old. Um, and then when we went into secondary school, uh, I met Stevie and, and Dill, and it was kind of, we were the few that played music in our school, you know, so we kind of very naturally came together and used to, you know, play guitar and things like that and lunch breaks and uh, and then Faye was a friend of Stevie and she happened to be writing songs as well and we kind of just started, not as a band necessarily, but we just started recording each other's songs and showing each other ideas and things like that and uh, I think... It was it was a, it was a while before we suddenly realised that maybe we should you know join forces to start a band. But Did you click straight away, or was there kind of a stage where it was like, okay, this is what I like, but actually, I'm not into you know. Um, no, I think that was Americana. The, so that was the, well, that was the good thing about it, you know. I like Green Day. Stevie might be like, you know, listen to this song by you know Bob Dylan, and I'd be like, wow, it's amazing. Listen to this song by, I don't know, you know Fleetwood Mac or Massive Attack and. And Faye would have been like, listen to this song by Mariah Carey. <laughs> <laughs> Named and shamed Faye. Straight in there. Are you the... I was going to say pop tar, but that's not, fair. that's not a fair way of saying it. Are you the appreciator of pop in the Little Green Cars? I mean, I, I think it's fair to say you are. I mean, yeah, actually. it's fair to say. <laughs> we, right we back are, at him. You know, we're, all, we're all appreciators of, you know, all sorts Good of things. So. Yeah, but, we, uh, we all like a bit of, well, uh, like I'm not even going to say that because everybody says that and it does my head and people say, I like everything. Yeah. You definitely don't like everything. But I mean, but from the very start, you must have all realised that you liked, you know, melodic, harmonic, um, you know, with the, the BVs, the U's, the A's, you mean, even if you think of Fleet Foxes, um, I'm thinking Neil Young. I mean, were these the bands that, or the influences that at the start, Stevie, that you were kind of going, yeah, I, I kind of like that too. And this is the kind of music we should focus on writing. I think that's what everybody likes. Good music. <laughs> Good really? Yeah. Have you looked at the charts People, recently? Well, <laughs> I suppose uh, it just had the the right kind of people like I had a, a musical family musical friends I had a, m most of my music taste was either what was in dad's car or what my brother was buying so it was like a mix between Dave Brubeck and then you get home and no FX or Nirvana or something else is on yeah and then I had my own kind of little country music thing so it kind of had this weird mix and all the greatest aspects of those music so you, you can have the melody out of something like jazz or classical music and then the energy out of punk music and then the I suppose the morals and the stories out of folk music and I suppose that's the essence of every great song so we just started to appreciate what a good song was from from the start. Um, you have signed for a major label, um, obviously with Last Note slightly uh, less sort of at the indie side of, but you're with U Music Universal. Was it your ambition, Faye, at the start to kind of to sign for a, a big label? And you're so young, like you're 21, 22. Was it the band's ambition to sign and have that the big deal or whatever, whatever you want to call it? Well, uh, speaking for the band as a whole, I think we just wanted to be able to continue, like wh whatever was going to, uh, you know, 
uh, make us you know be able to do this for as long as possible yeah on a personal level i suppose my biggest problem has always been that i've never looked far enough ahead into the future which has kind of been a bit of a hindrance so i was just kind of rolling with what was going on or well, it kind of happened slowly but so quickly at the same time if you know what i mean like we went through like a horrible arduous process of so and when you're 17 you're pretty naive about it and like i just i still have no idea how the music industry works at all <laughs> like people expect you to know these things yeah, and you don't yeah, have a clue you yeah. just you know you see what what you see from your own perspective mm. but we went through a process of oh someone's getting on a plane and they're actually flying over from london to see us play and that must be just so exciting though yeah but then they don't they, they don't come back <laughs> you know what i mean and that kept happening and we kept you know we went through the process of people sitting on the fence people saying no people saying they loved it and doing nothing about it you know what i mean and then eventually we signed to the label that we're we're now on and it's the way it's supposed to be i suppose and when did that happen? Was it last year or 2011? I want to say 2011. 2011. So, so I mean, like, Donna, from your point of view, did it suddenly change from like that? There was like you did the indie thing, you know. You were, you know, I wouldn't say you were sort of scratching around for many years because, like, it has come to you very young, which is great because um, you obviously have the talent to go with it. But um, what was the big thing about signing to a, a label? That, did it sort of everything just become more structured? I think a big part of it was relief because we we left school in 2010 and then it was Christmas 2011 by the time we signed a deal. So we've been working and working and working all day, every day, kind of for that one and a half years. And we had like eight, nine labels interested in us and then just dropped us. And then finally you kind of have something. And then we the next thing was to do was to plan the record, which was exciting. I mean, f and did you know from the start that you kind of had a sound that could be played on radio? Like, because you've obviously had three singles this year that are all getting played on national radio in Ireland, and I'm sure outside Ireland as well. I mean, did you realise, right, we kind of have a commercial sound, that this could be something that we can, we can actually push, that side of things? W did you want to do that? It's not, it's not something we thought about ever. Yeah. We, 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 we tried to... to write the songs as naturally as we could and we, we never really thought about what particular sound we wanted or what particular it's certainly getting on the radio was never an issue we wanted to make an album of you know a kind of a work an all together work of six songs that related to each other and told a story and I mean those songs a couple of those songs there's radio edit process there that's a nightmare because as a songwriter you don't want to chop your lyrics mm. up do you know what I mean? That's the last thing I want to do, is start thinking about which lyric is less important than the next, do you know what I mean? Like, you spend weeks, you spend, we spend like three, four weeks sometimes on one song getting the perfect arrangement, and then they chop two and a half <laughs> minutes out of it anyway. <laughs> it's, it's really, really frustrating. Why did they do that? I mean, like, f as an artist, that must be really annoying. It's, yeah, it's annoying. <laughs> <laughs> So what do you do? Do you stamp your feet and sort of scream and send Faye in to you well, know, rough them up a bit? I mean, I would. That's a good idea. I s well, we're not really d divas. I suppose we have to. E we don't really complain. We're pretty passive. <laughs> I could never tell. People walk all over us. Uh, but, I, you know, I suppose we have to be realistic to an extent, of course, that, you know, they're not going to you know, put put a guitar solo in the middle of one of our songs, but... Well, you, you do know. have a guitar solo in the John Wayne, just oh, to point that out. We, we put those You put that in, okay, that's all right. Phew. <laughs> I'm relieved to hear that. Yeah. Well, that was done by the good people at Imro did a nice sweet guitar solo. In <laughs> <laughs> Extra royalties, please. Thank you very much. Um, Adam, now that you've... You know, you were this band, as I say, that were been. You know, if you if you're on the, if you're watching music in Dublin, like somebody like myself would be. You know, everybody's talking about this band, Little Green Cars, for years and years. Um, and now you kind of you're out there. You've got an album, like you know, it's kind of weird that people know the name and that there's all these people showing up to the shows. And I was in the Button Factory in was it March or February, and the place is stuffed. It's full again tonight. Uh, yeah, it's crazy. Every every show that we play is kind of a. A surprise for us. We've just done our first, um, uh, our first kind of world tour. So we did a couple of dates in Europe, and then went over to Australia, and then went to America, and then back to to Europe. And um, particularly in Australia, you know, which is the other side of the world, the the couple of shows that we played over there every night, we did, you know, completely didn't 
don't know what to expect when you walk out on stage. We played a festival um, in in Byron Bay, and we played this tent, which was this big tent, you know, like you know the big tents in yeah, in Oxygen yeah. or Electric Picnic, and and um, we were backstage. It was empty, and we were doing our sound check. Went backstage for about five minutes, and came back out, and four thousand people, you know, and and people singing along as well. It was so it they was, know they know the songs. Yeah, and it's just, it's completely you know surreal, mm. absolutely surreal. I mean. You have looking at looking at some of the festivals you've done this year. You've done some great festivals. I think myself and Dylan were mentioned earlier on. You've done um, Lollapalooza and you've done Oshega in in Montreal. Um, do you kind of pinch yourself and go, "Wow, this is deadly." I'm playing in like you know, like the festival that I remember like five years ago. I was looking at these bands and thinking, "That's a pretty cool festival." Um, well, yeah, because I think the the main thing is as well that we're absolutely blessed with an amazing team over in America and mm -hmm. you know and in Europe as well that. Like really great pluggers, and we have a, an amazing agent as well, who books us these shows. And I mean, L L Lollapalooza was amazing. I thought because Faye lost her voice, but then <laughs> <laughs> that's why <what laughs> it was amazing. It was the biggest nightmare because Faye woke up with uh, with her voice, and then we had to work out a new set and a new plan. And but then the whole crowd got behind us then at the gig. Voice was, did it come back? Yeah. Just reappeared just before. It's, they say the adrenaline always just well, brings it back. Well, the adrenaline and whatever that doctor gave me sh <laughs> shot up into my arm. Oh, I've heard about this. <laughs> yeah. Didn't, um, like, w uh, like, Tina Turner used to get them jabs in the... I think she got to get in her backside, basically. But you were lucky. You got yours in your arm. That's not so bad. No, I, and it's funny because, like, uh, someone asked me a question recently about what makes a good festival and stuff. And obviously, everyone has... You have your own personal standards. Yeah. Like, each we are five individual people that, you know, I'm not listening to what the hell you're doing right now. I'm kind of focusing on myself. You know, because all you get is what's blasted out of your wedge. Yeah. But it's very interesting when, like, for example, that's the worst, for me, it's the worst thing that's like asking a drummer to play with two broken arms. Do you know what I mean? Like, I, what you, I'm a singer, like, and to go on and to not be able to sing and to have the best gig that you've ever played, it's like, it's funny because it's kind of crowd reaction. And that's what changes every time. Yeah, you know, get that is... In the golf carts to to and from the state, and we were there. But they were like, "Okay, the show must go on." We were holding our guitars and like sitting on the backs of these <laughs> these golf carts going, and it was kind of like the start of like Saving Private Ryan. We were like, "Mom, I want my mom." <laughs> and then, yeah, and then we got there you know, onto the stage and. We, Oh, and then the door comes. <laughs> yeah, we just it, the, they they were more friendly than the the, the Germans, I suppose. <laughs> you've you I mean you've supported these incredible acts as you've gone along. Uh, Jake Bog, uh, you did a tour with him, and you did Neil Young. Um, did you meet the great man? Neil, we well we were like this, and he was like here you know like so while we were sand I, I was tuning my guitar up and you know we were setting up the stage and you know it was empty pitch and uh stevie kind of turns to me and he goes you know <laughs> and i, I kind of just did this and then suddenly he's kind of walking up and uh i was like oh my god there's no young walked around the back of the stage the stage is like bigger than most of the stages kind of just the stage itself is bigger than most of the venues that we'd ever played so he was kind of pacing around and inspecting his stuff, and uh, he was going, "I've got that, I've got that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's pretty cool." Five I'll of those, yeah. and then and then so we get get on with our thing, you know, trying not to stare at him, and then um, and then so I'm kind of things around. Suddenly I look up and he's standing right beside me, just kind of looking out over the pitch, you know, about the show he's about to play, <laughs> and uh, I kind of froze, and then in a minute he was gone, and only after he was gone did I realize like Neil Young was standing right next to me and. You, I actually, you could feel the aura of just talent. <laughs> That's pretty intense. It was, it was extremely intense. Did he say anything? To you? Did he offer you any advice as a young band? No, but apparently he, he actually did watch the show from the side of the That's stage. That's cool. But uh, I don't know. Be, you wouldn't be surprised if he's cranky. You know, these he old was. Guys. He was apparently having. Well, like the the sun was shining, in onto the directly <laughs> onto the stage. I yeah. I went right before he went on to backstage area where the toilets are cleaner and I was coming back around I was uh, blowing my nose and I was coming back around and a security man was like stop 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 
And I was like, ha not very funny. <laughs> and he was like, no, no, really stop. And I was like, what's going on? And they're like, Mr. Young is coming out now. And I was like, <laughs> and I was right by his dressing room and then you know, he came out with his entourage and his oh. his manager came over to me and was like, Hey, that was a great show and you know, like That's good. Like, yeah, it feels yeah, I mean was, that's gonna he feel was good. like he was like, um it's gonna be a great show tonight and I was like, Why is that? And he was like, The sun is shining in Neil's eyes. He doesn't like that. <laughs> <laughs> he's gonna be mad. He plays his best gigs when he's mad. And I was, he that likes the cool. uh, the blood to be angried up. That's good to know. Um, I mean, for you guys, obviously, you did just kind of looking at the highlights. The you did the Jimmy was it the Jimmy Fallon show was that in America? I mean, is that like you know we see sort of these kind of spoof shows like um, Larry Sanders show? I mean, is being on an American chat show like is it like really intense or is it like really OTT TV? Well, they're very helpful. We literally, when we go in, you can't touch anything because if this guy's jobs are like to, you know, move that there and put this over here. And if you move it, they're like, hey, you put me out of the job. <laughs> but then, like, because we, so we I like it actually because I, I, yeah. I got to then go, like, move that there, move that there. <laughs> I'm kind of. Do you get a nipple tweaker? Is that part of the deal when you go into these places? I mean, so I'm pretty sure. Is. What's tweak, a nipple tweaker? Tweak your nipples. JLo, JLo has a, a nipple tweaker. I just wondered if, if when you get to a certain stage, is that you, a, is, you, a, is there a punchline coming or is this? No, a, it's for real. I'm just saying. There's. So just, you walk in the door and they. Go, yeah, just to make sure because you know it's never cold in America, so you never get into that sort of nipples like bullets stage. Well, we, I'm just we, saying you should probably ask our, for it the next our time. Our clothes were thick enough. We weren't, <laughs> you know, as they say, smuggling raisins. <laughs> Lovely. Um, do you enjoy the touring side of things? Because you've mentioned Australia, you have mentioned America and Germany and we're on. I mean, for yourself, Dylan, is it a fun side of being in a band? Got to um, be. I think it's it's every band's dream, really, to be doing what we're doing and touring around America and stuff. Because I really enjoy it because I'm just, I just like that. But I think, you know, everyone's different in terms of how they deal with touring. Um, like, the crowd is different, like we were saying. And... I think the main thing with gigs and when you're touring is like each gig is so different and the human side of us playing so that's why a lot of Palooza was so crazy because they understood the human side of the band that Faye was sick and then they got behind us so I think when people understand that that's how gigs get better and inside and with touring then yeah it's quite can it be can flat. it be a lonely place like when you're there and you roll up and it's like Faye do you it's get it's certainly not lonely because we're all crammed into a <laughs> hotel room. It's that's the opposite of lonely. What's it like for you, Faye, um, on the road with four smelly boys? That sounds like it's an she's interesting. She's the smelliest one. Yeah, <laughs> um, I mean, it's wonder. It's amazing. Like I grew up with these guys. Like you know, yeah. since we were fourteen. Like they're my mates. It's not like we sat and auditioned everybody. But at the same time, it's extremely isolating. You know, it is. Like I can say that. I, I'd love to say that I'm happy every day and that I have. You know, but I'm a woman. She's not, she's I'm moody. She's so moody. I'm so moody. <laughs> You're allowed. <laughs> but You're it's like, it's simple things like, you know, like it takes me more than 10 minutes to get ready. You know that, you girls, you ladies, you know that. To, you know, and that kind of thing. And like, nobody has a bobbin and just <laughs> like, and there isn't that many women in, in, you know, there's no, you don't see too many women in, you know, lighting technicians or sound engineers or stage managers. Like it's, it's, a, it's a man's world. Like you kind of come to terms with that and you kind of just, want to fit in and be equal to everybody. You want to feel a sense of equality and sometimes you, yeah. But I mean, it's amazing. I got four people to protect me the whole time and lift me around and who's carry your, my who's stuff your, and carry my suitcase. Who's your main protector? I mean, if, there, if, if you know, if shit well, gets share, real, who I do you sh- turn to? Is it I Donna? I share a room with these two. So <laughs> there's no privacy in that regard either. These two are my roommates. So probably one or the there's other, they take turns. No secrets between sailors, I presume. Obviously there's at no this stage <laughs> you get to... <laughs> Sleep head to toe. I don't know what you were going to say there. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm no, I'm just thinking, I think Donna could be useful. Like if, you know, if, if, if backs were to the wall, I'm thinking you've got that sort of Dolph Lundgren sort of, uh, you know. I'm like a cornered rat. Yeah. <laughs> Last action. Yeah. You're going to come out. Yeah. I'm just, uh, yeah. um, can I talk to you about the songwriting process? Obviously, we're here at Imro and um, lots of songwriters and whatnot. I mean, from yourselves, I read somewhere... I think it was you said, Steve, that the, that the record, the record Absolute Zero, 
as this record constantly jumps between two contrasting perspectives. This is good. The beauty of a reckless youth and the fear and confusion caused by our ever-pending adulthood. Does that sum up the lyrical thrust of Absolute, absolute Zero? Yes. Um, well, I suppose the record was, ri uh, was written over, you know, three, four years. Yeah, of course. Of when we were, what age, 15 or 16 to now, which I think it's fair to say is a fairly, you know, sort of a turbulent time in everyone's life. It's not necessarily a side that gets talked about a lot in either music and stuff because problems that seem to have, you know, the weight of the world in them when you're 17 are pretty irrelevant when you're 18 or two weeks after. But at the end of the day, I don't know, like, you know, things that seem like are going to destroy your whole world, you know, when you're 17 are the small things. And those kind of build up and your teenage years are like the a human ice age of your brain. Everything just freezes over and you just have to wait to get out of it. Well, put it to you this way. Do you still connect with the guy in, say, the John Wayne? Do, when you hear those lyrics, you think, yeah, I get that. Do 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 Well, yeah, because I think that the things that happen to you at this age resonate throughout the rest of your life and they kind of shape who you're going to become. I'd be a very different man if that girl in the John Wayne had accepted me. <laughs> that was you. I thought that was a... Um, uh, but I think one of the things that sort of does mark out your, your lyrics, Faye, is, is, is sincerity. It's just, it feels like it's really like, particularly, say, with um, my, my love took me down to the river to silence me. Uh, Oh, I listened to that song for the first time. I was like, wow. I mean, uh, the vocal is incredible. Um, it's, it's a great song on the record, on a great record. Um, do you find it weird that so many people know how you feel? Like, really, like, really deep down? Because it does seem like a really personal sentiment, personally described lyric. Well, I wouldn't say necessarily that they know how I feel, but I think they might know how they feel in, in their own way re relating to that. Because nobody can really say that they... They've, they know how, I don't know how, you know, I don't know how all of you feel right now. Do you know what I mean? But it's interesting because I think sincerity and honesty is something that everyone strives for. And like, I don't achieve that necessarily through my, the course of my entire life. And especially when you're trying to articulate yourself. Like I write music a lot of the time because I don't know if you've noticed, but I'm not the best at articulating myself. So music for me is how I try and say what I really mean. And it's and then you get get signed and you have to talk about it and you're like Jesus. And that's the, is that that must be like tough. Yeah, well, like, I can't I can't like articulate these myself as well as like my music and and that's the way I'm trying to speak. Like the kitchen floor is something that I like that song meant a lot to me and it literally just got on the album at the very last second and I'm so happy it did because it was really important to me and it's a big weight off it's a weight off my shoulders in a sense because I can move on from it. And it's also kind of different as well, because when you experience something like, say, when you're 15, 16, 17, and as Stephen said, like, you know, it kind of shapes you as a person, and then you get up and have to perform it, like, you know, seven nights in a row, it's quite funny because you are, in a sense, reliving. I rem you know, I remember what I felt like. I remember everything how I felt like when I wrote that music. And I think it's, it's almost like a diary of sorts. Like, you don't, I don't remember other mo emotions that I felt with those songs I can and reliving them can be quite disturbing. <laughs> it can be quite upsetting as well and emotional and, and amazing at the same time. So yeah, it well is, it's nice being able to share with, with everybody. Like, I, I think everybody would agree in the room. It's, it's an incredible vocal. Like it's just an intensely emotive vocal. And I think it's just, I think it's something about the lyric and the, vo and the, the vocal together. Well, I'm a very melodramatic kind of person. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you nailed it. Um, Adam, how would you describe like this, the writing in the band? Like, How do um, Little Green Cars write? Because there are five creative forces here at work. So how do you actually bring it all together? Uh, well, usually Stevie or Faye will come in with the bones of a song written, and they'll take up an acoustic guitar, and they'll play it. And then we'll kind of go, that's good. And then we'll go, They'll pick up his sticks and I'll pick up my guitar <laughs> and then I'll pick up his bass and we'll just kind of kick it around for about three weeks. And, um, you know, might pull things out or move things around um, until it like, shapes. 
we always think that like emotions that you deal with emotions themselves are very very ugly things you know they're not kind of things that you want to sit around and stare at all the time or think about too much when we have a song it's like this and when it's just acoustic guitar this is just the raw emotion this is just the feeling at the time and but we're trying to sell these emotions so we gotta doll them up so we try it. We t it's as if we're taking a, an extremely ugly person mm. and putting them through one of those TV shows where they get like new clothes <laughs> and a new face. And so when we, you know, we come out at the other end of the song, we kind of have this either beautiful thing or this sort of grotesque transvestite monster thing. <laughs> Are you looking at Donna or Faye? No, I'm, looking <laughs> I'm looking behind Donna. You're describing somebody there. That's interesting. Well, it's, you know, like, so a song has to be, you know, pretty, too, as well as... Mm, well, see, every time we work on these songs, we go from the inside out. So it's always been when Faye and Stevie bring, like, stuff to, to the band, it's, we're always so heavily focusing on the lyrics especially because I think that's the sentiment and we always take it inside out. Yeah, and I think yeah. that's probably why, you know, some people say that our album has got quite an, ec an eclectic sound to it and it's because th there's such a wide range of range of emotions and you know. But you see I actually think I actually think differently having listened to it through many times. I I find it really well focused and I just wonder how you managed to kind of when you have five different creative forces and is it three lyric writers in the band? Am I right in saying that? Because Adam, you were no, credited two, on. There's two primarily. I, I'm, I had like a line in, in my love to me. Okay. 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 Exactly. Yeah. But you. But the the themes are very folk. Like you do bring them all together very well. I mean, as a band, Faye, how do you kind of sort of agree? Well, this is what we want to write about. This is what we want to say. Sometimes we don't agree. Sometimes we come yeah. around to the idea. Do you know what I mean? Like it would grow on you necessarily. Um, um, what was the question again? <laughs> how do you, I mean, how do you kind of sort of get on, like, you know, so how do you make sure that the the message, because your lyrics are really clearly a big part of the album. I just wonder with a band like yourselves, how do you make sure, like, it's not like, oh, we take Oasis for an example, Noel Gallagher's writing all the lyrics, Liam says, oh, I've got Songbird, can I put this on it? But that's four albums in, do you know what I mean? You guys are starting off here, you've got two predominantly two lyricists here I mean do you and Steve sit down and sort of agree right we're going to write about this this is where we're going to be well I think that's the good thing about it is that there's <clears throat> it's alternative perspectives I mean especially because it's male female in a sense and also I think it's funny because everybody knows what we're talking about because we've spent way too much time together <laughs> so people are like I know what you're talking about and you're like no you don't shut up you don't know but you know it's just um, I think there's always going to be disagreements and I think like somebody's always going to feel a little bit misrepresented among five people in some point at some time but you know primarily we all want the same thing and primarily we're all five people who've grown up together and experienced each other growing up and everything like that so hopefully we can continue and you divide up the, the vocals I mean I'm thinking like again it's interesting because you don't see many bands doing that I mean classically Fleetwood Mac obviously would have done it brilliantly I mean is this is this something you're going to develop are you going to continue to divide vocals up you know between the two lead singers well I think vocals and singing have always been a big part of this band because they've been the things that we would have connected with the most in music and it seems like almost the whole world is going through this like musical revolution where all of a sudden, like the most desired instrument is the human voice, and yeah. you know, it's five people all singing one thing together can make it very uh, emotional. That we've used that word far too much today. <laughs> emotional. You, well, you're in connection with your your emotions, and so it's emotional music. <laughs> Just to say, we will be hearing very shortly from the band as well. You're going to play us a, a few songs, but before uh, we go there, I did want to talk about Marcus Strauss as well, it's, because it is kind of exciting to get such a big name producer, a friendly German. 
He's 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 a, a what was it? You Adam said he's a German scouser. That's yeah, he's a German scouser. Yeah, it's a funny uh, accent. <laughs> we can't we 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 do a lot of impersonations as a band generally, you know, but we can't get that one. Nobody can, can do a Marcus Straves. The the credits that he had from before he met you guys and obviously since as well, because I know he's doing the new Arcade Fire album, I think, as we speak. Uh, Probably done, sure. is it? Yeah, it's done. Reflector. Um, how did you end up working with Marcus? We just kind of were like, you know, it was when we were writing the album, we were staying up in a house in Wexford and we were kind of, we, we, you thought it was when the Suburbs had just come out and we, we brought a vinyl player up and we had the vinyl and we were always sitting around at dinner being like, imagine if Marcus Straub did our album. And then when we had a deal and they asked us, who would you like to produce the album? We were like, uh, and we just chanced our arm. We were like, Marcus? Uh. Like, there's no way he's going to say yes. And he didn't say yes. He said no. He said he was too busy. And we were like, oh, okay. And then we went on searching and searching. And then one day, we just got a phone call being like, all right. You know, and he was like, I, I hadn't heard the music when I said no. And now I listen to it. And Do it to it in the accent. <laughs> now I listen to it and it's good. You know? <laughs> He doesn't sound anything like that. <laughs> Sounded like McBain off The Simpsons. Is he like McBain off The Simpsons? Sort of. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Nailed yeah, one it time, You know, for, he's extremely athletic, man. Yeah. I'm only, that's not connected to McBain at all. Well, he's pretty muscly. He's, he's muscly. Our, yeah, yeah, right, yeah. So one time, Marcus was standing in the kitchen door, and I pushed him out. And he went flying out, he landed on his hands, and then backflipped onto his feet. And we were like, God, this guy can produce a good record, and he can do a fucking backflip, too. <laughs> <laughs> Some people are just insanely talented. <laughs> is he a kind of a... Is he a... Well, I mean, well, I say, is he a characteristic producer? I mean, is he going to encourage a fae, or is he going to be like in your face, like, come on, get this right? Well, like, I mean, it's a pretty big thing to put in someone's hands, like, producing your record. Yeah. You know I mean, you don't know which way that's going to go, especially and only in hindsight now that I'm realising how lucky we, we are, mm. actually, because, I mean, um, he was just so involved in lyrics and lyrical content, and he was kind of sit you down, like, especially with Stephen, like, they'd be in there for hours laughing, and we'd all be like, they have a secret relationship. <laughs> but, um, you know, kind of, he really <laughs> wanted to... <laughs> He what really was going on in that room? <laughs> the content and where you're coming from and like, you know, even with me, he goes through something line by line by line by line. And kind of like us, the way the guys would say we'd work from the, the inner out. He was very much like that. And I think like he, I, I mean, we, we had never done anything near that scale before. So you think like, you know, Marcus Javs, he's worked with, you know, everybody that he's worked with. He really made you feel like you were completely equal with him, and mm. you were on the same playing field, and like made you made you feel like you were an artist, and that you were you know you were doing something that was worthwhile, as opposed to you know like I have a formula and I'm going to help you, and this is how it's done. It was nothing like that, so it was just kind of like it's just incredible for someone to respect you that much. Then you automatically trust them. It's yeah. like a respect and trust thing. So uh, no, it was a, it was pretty. Amazing. I mean, I'm sure a lot of people are, have heard uh, the album through. Uh, one thing that stands out for me is the playing on it is so good. Uh, were there lots of takes? Were there? Oh my god! Um, you think you can play guitar until you have to go <laughs> and make an album? I tell you, it is just like it is. It is one of the most depressing moments when you start really? recording the first song. <laughs> Uh, we generally we did we we would get in the room together and, and track everything live, and then you know you'd have to just make your f fix your few mistakes and, uh, and overtrack your guitars and. Uh, yeah, separates you the... You know those cones that dogs wear when they can't, you know, scratch their cuts or whatever, you know, this... Yeah. Kind of when I record my guitar, I tend to go like, like... Like, concentrating. He's got very bad sinuses. I got so. bad sinuses. <laughs> and so I had to wear this cone in my head to stop my breathing from going in the mic. Really? <laughs> Scratching. <laughs> I'm not. Your metaphors are so out there. I'm not sure. Is that no, was it a real the, cone? This is the truth. This yeah. is okay. Yeah. This isn't just. Uh, it was pretty. One of Stephen's metaphors. I had this guitar, and, and it kept rattling. So we figured out that we put a big, uh, this big clamp on the guitar and tighten it up. 
So like, you know, isn't it the ones that you like, lift up your car? With yeah, the and so it stopped the guitar from, from rattling. So I was sitting in there with this big metal guitar, with a big clamp on it, and a big cone around my head, <laughs> thinking like I'm such, listen, a, I'm such really a rock star. <laughs> listen really close to the last track on the album. You can very briefly hear the... <laughs> is this uh, this is obviously not an electric because you're a DI in this is an acoustic yeah, the, the, acoustic. Monday, the yeah. last song you can hear it um, <laughs> I would be turning that up to 11 <laughs> later on there he is heavy breather um, was there anything like when, I was wondering like when you go in with Marcus Straves and Faye alluded to the names that he's worked with you know you got Coldplay you've got um, Bjork, you've got the Maccabees, Arcade Fire. Was there anybody where you kind of thought, Jesus, we do not want to sound like X, Y, Z? Humphrey and Sons. Humphrey and Sons. <laughs> That's what I was expecting to hear. Um, Cause, because you could be pushed on that. It, it, we, you know, we were just, because what he wanted to do was make the anti-production album, which is, we probably shouldn't have gotten Marcus Strauss to do that. We could have done that ourselves. <laughs> We can do that at home, Marcus. Yeah, but let's talk some more. To make, like, let's just, you guys playing the songs the best you can, yeah. and we'll record it as well as we can. So like, the sound was never going to be changed by some sort of crazy input he was going to have. He was gonna Is that like, what you did? It does sound incredibly live. Yeah, and again, all the music was done. Tasty playing. Look, thank you. It is, I mean, it is tasty playing. Like, I'm thinking, how many overdubs are there? Like, did he yeah, make well, them like, do it 50,000 times? We did overdubs for, like, you know. I don't want to ruin the mystique. No, don't, don't. <laughs> that's, that's, I don't want to either. Now, it, you started doing the album in April 12th, not that long ago, and then you mixed it in August 12th. That's a shit long, long, long wait. Yeah, that is a shit Did it freak you out to like, wait five months to have your album mixed? Yeah. What do you do in those five months? Do you become a professional poker player, Stephen? Or do you wear a cone on your head and be you a performance artist? I, sh I should probably get that cone out someday. <laughs> I think that your fans need to see a picture of it, at least. I wonder if there is a picture of it. I don't know. Should have been I, on that's the album, a part, Steve? That's a memory of mine that is, I do not want to revisit anytime soon. Okay. You know, okay. You're standing outside... You know, this cone on and it's raining. <laughs> He's trying to have a cigarette. And, just, and suddenly, oh, I'm trying to fill up with water and puff my cigarette. <laughs> like Tom York in the video for No Surprises yeah, exactly as the water like just like begins that. to fill up. Um, it's almost a brilliant place, I reckon, to leave it all behind. Before we go, um, plans for a new album? What's next? I mean, I'm sorry not to even ask that because you you're really are still touring the current one. But Adam, what would you like to do next? Um... Well, we've obviously been doing so much touring, and so we're really just dying to get a little bit of time to get back into our rehearsal room and write together. And okay, you know, we're always, you know, always writing as much as we can and on the road and things like that. You know, but uh, I don't know. We'll see. What yeah. Happens. Well, whatever it is, I think we're all very interested to hear from it. And um, I think if you go back with Marcus, it gives. Stephen an opportunity to really get that accent down and obviously to get that comb back on as well. But um, it's an absolute pleasure talking to you guys. Would you please show your appreciation for <laughs> Little Green Cars. <laughs> little Green Cars. Before you do your thing, we have to open it to the, we've got a couple of little bit of housekeeping, but first of all, I should turn this over to the floor. Would anybody like to ask Little Green Cars, and anybody in the band, a question? Oh, okay. Here we go. Um, will I will I jump up with the microphone? Will I will I do that? Uh, or, or are you just you hang on? He doesn't need that. Hang on. You go for it yourself. It's, wow. No, no. Give him the microphone. Uh, okay, right. <laughs> this is it, my friend. Well, yeah, you are. Good. So, low green cars. Hello. If you were on, if you were the audience, and what would you ask yourself? That's a very, that's a f good way to ask a question, my friend. <laughs> what would I ask myself? What would you ask yourself? <laughs> what were you thinking? <laughs> <laughs> Drugs are these kids on. <laughs> Why didn't you comb your hair before you came out? God, they look really dirty. <laughs> I don't know. That? Is that all right? Yeah, I'm happy with that. I remember there was some other question, but I forget. You forget? Oh, you right. did really Sorry. good. I thought that was a really yeah. good question. Thank you. Now we're going to get the curveballs.
Anybody else like to ask a question of the band? Okay, I'll come over here. God, all the, all the youngest members of the audience. All right, sir. How did you come up with the name Little Green Cars? Good one. There's always one who asked that question. Uh, basically, you know how if you can't sleep, you can't sheep jumping over a fence? Do you know that? Well, basically, when I was younger and I couldn't sleep, instead of sheep jumping over a fence, I counted a car going around a racetrack, and they're like, yeah. <laughs> It just so happened to be a little green car, you know. So that was it. Wow. You happy with that, Noah? Yes. That's a pretty good answer. Yeah. Thanks very much. <laughs> Anybody else like to ask a question? Don't be shy. Um, they're very nice people. But if it's all right if there's... Oh, there's a lady over here. Okay. This feels like this is your life now. I feel like I'm Michael Aspel. All right. Um, um, what advice would you give to someone who's in a band and who's doing the whole singer-songwriter scene? Would you say to just stick with it? Or would you say there's a different route to go down other than that? I would say, you know, it's so e especially at a time like this, it's so easy to get disheartened with what you're doing and kind of lose faith in all of humanity. And you just, you have to, <laughs> you have to kind of teach yourself to be, get your satisfaction out of your art. You know, when we were when we were younger and we had aspirations of being a big band, I always think it was because. You know, we were trying to fill something within ourselves to be accepted by other people, you know, and making music was a way of doing that. If I was happy with just writing songs, you know, I probably wouldn't be sitting here. I suppose you have to, yeah, I'd always like say, you have to believe in what you do. And if you truly believe in what you do, it doesn't matter. Van Gogh never sold the painting, you know? And he's dead now. Don't cut off your <laughs> don't cut off your left ear though, I would say. That's probably it's a, not a yeah, not I'd a way to go. You just have to stick with what you do and uh, Would you would you um advise play lots of gigs? Because you guys gig so much even from the age of fifteen, sixteen, didn't you? Well we actually we took a lot of time not doing any gigs to hone in on what we wanted to achieve. You got your fast wrong there, buddy. I'm going to slap my research around the place later, Stephen, for that one. Yeah, we, we took like two, two, two years out of playing gigs to just write songs and practice because we didn't want to just play gigs for the sake of it, you know. We wanted to be, you know, showing something that was worthwhile. Cool. Um, would I wish I had better advice for you. I'm really sorry. <laughs> no, that's pretty good advice. Is that all right? Um, is that everybody? Would anybody else like to ask a question before we wrap things up and the band are going to play a live set? All right. Um, I think we are going to have a little presentation for uh, Little Green Cars Victor is here from Imro. So um, if you guys probably want to stand up, this is like, um, before we do. Uh, to mark your uh, number one album, Absolute Zero. Well done and congratulations. And uh, I know everybody wants to hear you play, so... Uh, I won't hold them any longer. So well done, guys. Well done. Thank you.